So in today's video, we're going to take a look at the Native people's use of fire. And we're going to do that by visiting a forest fire that occurred back in, in early December of 2024 in Great Barrington, where the top of a mountain called East Mountain caught on fire. I went up there to get some footage for the purpose of making a video about the Native people's use of fire as a landscape shaping tool. They used it for agricultural purposes, to burn off the undergrowth, to open up clearings. It's a lot easier than trying to whack down the trees with stone axes, right? So they use fire as an agricultural tool and also as a hunting tool. Now, they used it to drive game, but they also used it to remove something that would be quite hazardous to hunters, chestnut husks. If you've ever seen one, imagine stepping on one and imagine 60% of the biomass of particular areas being chestnut. The fire removes those husks and allows the native people a chance to get out and hunt safely. Using fire as a tool is a dangerous proposition. Typically, native fires, if done at the right time, will burn small areas of land and they won't damage most of the trees because the trees in New England are fire species for the most part. They have thick bark or shaggy bark that burns off. I'm starting off here on the border of Southwick, Massachusetts and Southfield, Connecticut, where the two states are combining to try to create a fire sculpted landscape, field and forest being the result, by using fire in a controlled way. And I would bet you that the controlled way that they're using fire is a lot more controlled than the way the native people used it. We know that this landscape was extremely fire rich by the species of plants that were native here at the time of contact. We also know because of the toponyms that the communities all along the Connecticut River have, we'll see field at the end of the name. Greenfield. Suffield, Brookfield, Deerfield, Hatfield, Westfield, Springfield. There's fields all over the place here. And this reflects what the colonists found when they settled. If fire is used regularly, the fire doesn't have a lot of fuel and it doesn't burn hot. It passes over the bracken on the ground from this, this and last year's fallen leaves and chestnut husks and hickory nut husks and basically burns them but it doesn't harm the trees for the most part because there's not a lot of bracken to provide tender for the fire they set fire to the undergrowth in the fall and sometimes in the spring i think the spring fires were generally accidental and the fall fires were planned i think this because we do have this known weather pattern in the, the Northeast called Indian summer. And the colonists, the early colonists, described the haze that Indian summer was marked by because in that November time, usually Indian summer is going to be a warm spell after the first hard frost. And that would usually take place in late October or November. And they would remark about the haze, the smoke that filled the air because of the native fires. So we're taking a look at fire as a tool for shaping landscapes. And we're doing that by taking a ride up to Great Barrington, where a forest fire recently burned more than a thousand acres on the top of East Mountain. Fall in New England is known for long twilights. That's a good thing. I'm heading west on Route 57 right now. And I'm in Sandisfield. Just went through the old center of Sandisfield. And I'm heading for Great Barrington. And I'm doing that because Great Barrington's on fire right now. Well, 1,100 acres of Great Barrington's on fire right now. Yesterday, they thought they had a small forest fire of 100 acres contained on the side of East Mountain. But that fire has gotten out of hand. The wind changed direction, as it often does in New England. And now we've got an 1,100 acre brush fire, really forest fire. Now, New England has been in a drought since August, and as a result, there's a lot of dry tender out there. There's a lot of leaves on the ground that have no slick, no moisture. 
in between them as they typically do in a New England fall. I mean, we'll often get droughts in July and August, but by the time you get to September, you start getting rain. That hasn't happened this year, although our meteorologists tell us that there's supposed to be maybe half an inch to an inch of rain in the next couple of days all over the area. So we'll see how that works out. But right now, there are firemen from all over the region trying to put this fire out. There are 400 other fires that are burning in southern New England right now as a result of this dry period along with all the freshly fallen, really dry leaves. So we're going to get up there. We're going to check out this forest fire because we want to talk about forest fires in the history of the northeastern woodlands. Now, our woodlands were famously sculpted by the native people who used fire to do that. Oh, you can see the fire in front of me right there. You see the line of fire on the hillside in front of us? Holy cow, there's East Mountain consumed. The fire is marching right down the hillside. It almost looked, when I saw it initially, like somebody had lit up a bunch of solar lights, but that's a fire. So I don't know if anybody's being evacuated, but look at that fire advancing down the side of East Mountain right there. It's pretty amazing. Somebody here stopped to check it out. It will pull off. There are people up here because this is the best place to view it. But this fire, from where I am right here, appears to be maybe two miles long, maybe even three miles long. And you can see the cord of the fire from north to south advancing along what's called East Mountain in Great Barrington. And you can see there's a pall of smoke hanging up there as the fire moves along the mountainside. Pretty amazing. So I think you can see the fire coming down the mountainside in front of me. Henry David Thoreau, after he set fire to 300 acres in Concord, Massachusetts, sat back and watched the fire and talked about the sublime splendor of nature. There is something sublime about this, but the fire wasn't set by America's favorite essayist of the 19th century. This was a fire that was probably the result of someone burning outside. It's really hard to say, but what we do know is that there are sparks coming up as this fire burns and the fire can jump. Now, interestingly, there are houses on the side of this hill, and I would imagine that the local fire departments are trying to keep those houses from going up in smoke, because there's probably six houses on the road that goes down to Three Mile Pond, which is right below where I'm showing you the fire. The Three Mile Pond is at the bottom of the hill there. So this is why I like my off-road lights. I can really light up the environment that I'm moving around in. Now, you don't want to be hitting anybody with the, uh, the high beams, but these are giving me a lot of nice projection as I move down Beach Hill Road in Sheffield. Now, on the other side of the valley that we were just looking at, and the fire is going to be above me from here. So, the fire is literally thousand feet above these houses and I think I, I would imagine they're a little worried if I had a house here I'd be a little worried but I, I expected to find emergency vehicles down here but I didn't find any this is where you'd want to set up a kind of a fire cordon up above these houses that mountain is on fire right there, and I'm down below it, maybe a quarter of a mile below it right now. And from the glow on the clouds above, I know that the, east, the west side of the mountain is much more strongly burning right now. But you can see that fire coming down the side of the mountain. 
in some places more bright than others as it catches a pile of leaves that have been deposited behind a tree or lights up some real dead timber. But that, that's marching down. It's still a long ways away. And on the other side is Butternut Basin, the ski resort. And I don't know how strongly it's burning up there, but you can see it here. So I'm standing here. And the fire is blazing behind me, as you can see. I've gone along to the southeast side of East Mountain, and you can see the fire moving down the side of the hill. We're on the Housatonic side of the fire now. So what I can tell you is that as the night goes on and you get radiational cooling, we are still in front of the storm that's coming. And the radiational cooling is going to cause updrafts and you can really see that fire glowing on this east side of the mountain whereas on the west side or northwest side of the mountain it wasn't nearly this kind of intensity that we saw so you can see outlined against the smoke massive white pines and there's areas where the fire's really catching on you can see some real serious blazing up there as the fire is lighting up the night sky and the wind is coming out of the southwest right now which is fairly typical when there's any kind of storm coming so on the east side of the mountain we can see that that fire is really burning and it's actually burning hot enough here because of the up grass to be catching some of the dead trees and probably scorching a lot of living trees bark. This is going to create quite an interesting area to study as we watch the forest regrow. In an area where fire was used consistently, the fire will simply remove the dead bracken from the past year. In this case, it had removed the grasses, it had removed the pokeweed, it had removed the goldenrod that we can see standing here and it would reduce it to ashes providing a fertile soil to be nutrients for the following year's grasses and wild plants. Consistent use of fire ends up creating a pretty verdant landscape. The native people practicing their own efforts at controlled burns would have set the undergrowth on fire in October or November of the year as a result of the fact that the weather patterns in New England will mean weekly storms. And I'm not sure if they would set it at a particular time. Nobody really knows. The colonists at the time thought it was a terrible waste of land and they didn't like it. It was removing a lot of the trees that they would want for firewood themselves. It was a practice that they really couldn't stand. And they tried to prevent the native people in the valley. from. If fire is used regularly, the fire doesn't have a lot of fuel and it doesn't burn hot. It passes over the bracken on the ground from this and last year's, year's fallen leaves and chestnut husks and hickory nut husks and basically burns them. But it doesn't harm the trees for the most part because there's not a lot of bracken to provide tender for the fire. On the uphill side of a tree though, the force of gravity brings bracken down the hill where it collects and the fire will burn a little hotter, which is why the basal scarring of the trees on the uphill side exists. So when we get to trees such as the one below me, which is actually a white oak that's growing symbiotically with a hemlock, pretty cool, a couple white oaks doing it, we can see that there's an accumulation of bracken on the uphill slope here. A fire is going to get better sustenance from that bracken right there, and it's going to burn hotter. And that will lead to basal scarring, showing us that the fire burned hotter here and actually damaged the bark, but not enough to kill the tree. The forest gives us clues when we look at trees as to the use of fire in the environment or the effect of fire in the environment. On the side of the mountain, if you're in 
in Great Barrington, however, we're going to see some real serious basal scarring. And I'm going to head back up to the top of the mountain this spring, hopefully before the black flies, and investigate how the fire affected the trees on the side of the mountain. So while we kind of look at fire as a disaster, I think our forests are going to look at it a little differently. The invasive species that have made their way in, many of them, not all of them, are not fire tolerant. And they'll be removed by wildfires, giving native species a chance to reestablish themselves. Fire, no longer used as a tool in most places, can be good for our environment. Not if your home's in the way, though, and our heart goes out to those people in Los Angeles who have lost so much. So you can see here where that fire is really raging. On the edge, over on the left, and right here on the right. It's obviously grabbed the hold of some dry timber. There's a lot of dead trees in our New England forest with the beech bark disease, beech leaf disease killing the beeches, and the emerald ash borer killing the ash, and the woolly adelgid, and all those good fellas at work. And this fire is really cleaning out the top of this mountain. And I'll tell you, the mountain itself extends another 800 feet above the line of fire that you're looking at. This fire's probably two miles long now from where it starts on the right. And you can't see where it starts. All the way back down to the left. It's really going. And I kind of feel like the updrafts on the east side are going to really catch it up. I imagine that this eastern side of the fire is going to get really hot as the wind stokes it. There's a lot of white pine here. And pine will burn and pine will cinch, but it's probably not going to kill it. The fire that we've seen in this video has been very beneficial to the forest on East Mountain. Now, it's a small fire put out within three days by a weather system and the work, hard work of fire crews from all over the Berkshires and the Connecticut River Valley. Fires that get out of control, though, can end up doing some serious damage, as we've seen in L.A. And in the history of Northeast forests, and really the history of forests all over North America, fire has always been part of the environment, from lightning strikes before the last ice age, through the time of the native people. I mean, native people have been in our, you know, they've been on the North American, South American continent for 25,000 years, 30,000 years. And in that entire time, they've been using fire as a hunting tool and agricultural tool in the last couple thousand years. And when we think about it today, when it threatens property and it threatens homes, buildings, we look at it as a disaster. But if we consider our natural environment, it's really a restorative experience and an experience that can be made positive, as we're trying to do here in western Massachusetts and northwestern Connecticut, by using fire to reshape the landscape and bring back its original plant species and habitats.